Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences, and I'd also like to welcome those of you who watch it later on our YouTube channel or Facebook. It's my great pleasure to welcome Tyler Stovall back to the uh, Commonwealth Club. Um, he's an old friend. He's out in New York now, so we're coming directly from New York. Um, but uh, lots and lots of people here in the Bay Area know Tyler. And uh, your friends at the University of California and at Commonwealth Club and at Humanities West all wanted to say hi to you. And thanks a lot for, for uh, joining us virtually this time. Um, Thank you. So, um, first of all, you know, how did you, I mean, obviously the, the timing on the book is great, um, but you must have started it more than, you know, a month ago. So uh, what, what, <laughs> what, <laughs> when, when did you get started on this history? Because it's very timely. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for welcoming me back to the Commonwealth Club and to the Bay Area. It's really nice to be here, even if it is virtual, but then what isn't virtual these days? So uh, <laughs> it's great to be here. Well, you, you raise an interesting question because the thing about the book, it starts with a story that was one of the major reasons why I wrote the book. It starts with the, the issue of the U.S. Capitol building mm -hmm. and the fact that it was built in part by slaves. And I wrestle with the whole idea of how you would have a building that has so come to symbolize freedom that it was often known as the Temple of Liberty, and yet it was built in part by slave labor. Mm -hmm. And I talk a bit about how when this was proven, when this became clear at the beginning of the century, Congress appointed a commission to explore the, the whole role of slave labor in building buildings like the Capitol building. And they decided once the report came out to um, create a, a space called Emancipation Hall in the Capitol building to, to honor the memory of the slaves. And it's interesting to note that this was a truly bipartisan effort. Both mm -hmm. Republicans and, and um, Democrats supported it. President George W. Bush signed it into law in 2007, 2008. And I started with that because it was both an inspiring story and in many ways, also an unsettling story, because as I argue in the book, why would you call a building that was built by slaves or a room built by slaves Emancipation Hall mm -hmm. as a way of honoring their memory? Because, of course, they weren't emancipated. And why not call it Slave Hall instead? Yeah. And why was it impossible to do that? So that was one of the things that got me thinking. And then, of course, a couple of weeks ago, we saw a very different face of the U.S. Capitol building. Mm -hmm. And um, that really underscored this whole problematic debate about it because you had a situation where you had a mostly white crowd invading the Capitol building, talking about over and over again, talking about their lost freedoms. Mm -hmm. And yet very much in conscious of the fact that these freedoms are built at a price and they were built oftentimes by people that were not free and were not able to enjoy those freedoms in the first place. Yeah, you, you, you have another idea and I was going to go to this later, but I think this is a good time since you're talking about the... the the assault on the Capitol. Um, but you talk about fascism later, and you mentioned that the use of the word liberty is used by the fascists too in the early 20th century, um, and that it was the freedom of the state to survive, not for the individual, but for the state to survive. So I was wondering how that fit into the narrative of what went on at the Capitol, because a lot of those people were willing to give up their individual freedom in a way and uh, destroy the institutions of democracy in order to get their freedoms back. I thought it sounded very similar. That's right. That's right. No, and it really does speak to, you know, in part, who organized that movement because it was organized by many far-right groups that yeah. had definite links to historical fascism. But, yeah, you get all of these paradoxes. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, the fact that people said that they were there because they wanted to specifically protect their freedom to vote, protect the rights, their rights to have their votes counted because they felt that they weren't counted. Mm -hmm. Uh, this tended to ignore the fact that they were doing this at the, at the behest of a Republican Party that had been engaged in voter suppression for years, mm -hmm. and including especially uh, this past year. And so when they were talking about the freedom to have one's vote counted, they were really talking about a kind of white freedom because they were concerned about the freedom of whites to have their votes counted. 
and not those of anybody else. But yeah, it's also paradoxical that you would have people who are in many ways very individualistic, nonetheless talking about the freedom prote to, to protect a certain characteristic of the state, a certain character of the state that would benefit them. Yeah, you, you bring up these paradoxes a lot, and I, I, I want to uh, let the readers know that by the end of the book, you're still hopeful <laughs> before we go through all these depressing details. <laughs> but but uh, one of the paradoxes uh, of this uh, reminds me uh, of how people are all afraid. I mean, Hollywood makes these movies of the aliens coming and, and, and turning the human race into food, right? And, mm -hmm. and the reason it's so scary, I think, for people is because we turn other races into food. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's so the paradox is there uh, in everything. I, I somehow I think that the paradox is uh, why we have those fears, because we feel unsettled by the distinction between what we want, what we want for others. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the same kind of distinction that allows us to have the eagle as our as our animal, you know, and people admire the lions and tigers and eagles and, and Bonnie and Clyde, they like top predators, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what people, sharks, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's what people admire because I, you know, they, they feel the paradox of, of not being able to do their will the way they want. to. So we have mm -hmm. this paradox. Um, but in the midst of all this paradox, there is some movement in a positive direction. So, so, but, but we, we let's go back and talk about it. Um, one of the things uh, you, you start around the enlightenment, Mm -hmm. um, a, a different historian that I had on here about six months ago uh, pointed out something that I found interesting, which was uh, around the time of the last plague, uh, since we were in the middle of this plague, mm -hmm. around the time of the, the last big plagues in the 1500s, um, there were four big empires. Three of them were Muslim empires, uh, Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. uh, the one out of Persia, uh, and then mm -hmm. in the Mughal Empire in India, and then the Ming Empire, not Muslim, but uh, Chinese. Mm -hmm. None of them mm -hmm. were white empires. Um, mm -hmm. And he made the point that Europe was kind of a, a, a mess and impoverished at the time. And so at the time of that plague, everybody fell back uh, and they, the, the rich, enlightened sort of empires, uh, civilizations, they just uh, tried to keep the status quo the way it was. Mm -hmm. They became conservative, whereas the Europeans had nothing to lose and they went off all over the world. And, and this uh, created... Well, the age of discovery, it created the Industrial right. Revolution. And maybe that gave the white people a, a, an idea that they were on top, uh, you know, with sort of a false optimism about how superior they were when actually it was just that they were uh, at, at they were in the right place at the right time uh, being mm -hmm. impoverished. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like the story of the, the great Chinese fleet that sailed in the 17th century to Africa. Um, right. And, you know, they, they could still find little pieces of Chinese porcelain on the, the shores of places like Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. But they turned around because they just felt there was nothing better than what they had in China. So why go anywhere else, right? Right. And that was not the situation in Europe, right? That they felt that they really needed uh, things from outside European home territories. And that so the, the, their explorations were in many ways explorations based on need uh, and even inadequacy as opposed to the kind of self-sufficiency that you know, the Ming and the Qing empires rep represented in China. Yeah, and uh, it would be helpful, I think, for white Europeans to remember that. So, uh, you know, and, and in terms of what happened next, yes, uh, there was great success and so on. Um, you have a lot of other ideas. We, we, we got to get to them. I love your idea about, about how mm -hmm. the colonization followed the end of slavery. Um, mm -hmm. but, but let's uh, go back to the beginning. And uh, one of the things I really liked about what you did was that you, you compared the France and, and, and the United States. Um, I know that uh, French history is uh, one mm -hmm. of your specialties. So it, we can start around the Enlightenment, and, and, uh, which is how you started. And I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. curious. Um, you, one of the things that you mentioned is that the Enlightenment uh, sort of gave rise to the idea of racism even though that was sort of uh, gave rise to liberty, but also gave rise to uh, slave slavery was at its height and this white racism. Do you think mm -hmm. that enlightenment led to that or was a reaction to it? You know, was it, was it to try to be more reasonable what was going on or was it actually they're combined as one? I mean, I think, I think it's a bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at the origins of the enlightenment, the enlightenment follows on the heels of the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th centuries. And what, initially inspired enlightenment thinkers was the idea that they were going to apply scientific reasoning mm 
not to the natural world, which is what the scientists had done in the 16th and 17th centuries, but to the study of humanity mm -hmm. uh, and approach it from scientific principles. One of the things that meant was a, a desire to categorize humans into different groups and mm. to explain why those differences came to exist and how they manifested themselves. And so you get all these ideas of hierarchies of peoples, which become hierarchies of races. And mm -hmm. they, uh, those ideas of hierarchies integrate the idea of different qualities and ultimately inferiority and superiority into mm -hmm. how we look at human beings. And it's interesting because many European, many European Enlightenment philosophers did not necessarily see their engagement in racial thinking as an engagement in racism. Not, mm -hmm. not at all. They saw it as simply, you know, looking at the objective facts of how different groups of people uh, had manifested themselves over time, how they had uh, made achievements, what were their skills, what were their uh, strengths, and what were their weaknesses. But what you get out of it, and this becomes especially prominent really more in the 19th century, was this idea of racial superiority and an inferiority. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to approach your question, which is, I think is an excellent one, sort of the chicken or the egg question, George, mm -hmm. um, this is happening at the same time that the world, at least the Western world, is really being shaped around race. It's the period of the, the great growth of the slave trade. And one of the things I look at is that the beginnings of the, the real height of the slave trade come right after the, the heels of the decline of challenges to what I've called white freedom, like, uh, like uh, piracy, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, in many ways represented a, a rejection of this idea of sort of straight-laced or sort of institutionalized freedom in favor of what you people did what they wanted to do. I mean, one of the, mm -hmm. the anecdotes I use in the book, you know, I pose the question about one of the great symbols of American freedom is uh, our jury system. Mm -hmm. And yet I ask, and I want people to be honest in their answer, when do you feel more <laughs> free, when you're serving on a jury or when you get out of jury duty, right? right. So, so two different ideas of freedom, in effect. And um, the fact that these, this idea of sort of institutionalized freedom also becomes racialized into what I've called white freedom is really a product of historical evolution that starts with the Enlightenment, but really starts to become very pronounced, by, certainly by the 19th century. Well, it's interesting how, how influential Darwin's uh, idea and, uh, and, and Hegel's idea about, you know, that everything led to us. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, right, right. <laughs> Like like the entire the entire process of the last you know a couple billion years has all been waiting to get to us you know it's a, right. it's a little, little narcissistic but uh, <laughs> which begs the question what happens after us right right exactly <laughs> but, but but that 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 was part of the ideas in the among the intellectual world which increased this idea that and, and as you point out uh, about Rudyard Kipling by the end of that century that it's the white man's burden to to you know help everybody mm -hmm. else get to be like we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And it is seen as a, you know, the, the French call it the civilizing mission yeah. that France was a country that was going to bring civilization to the peoples of its colonies and rejects the idea that they already had their own civilizations that they were quite happy with, but mm -hmm. they had to learn from the French or they had to learn from Europeans. Right. Yeah. Well, they weren't speaking French, so how could they possibly be? Happy? Right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you have it. Right. <laughs> I always, I always, I feel for the French, and you must too, being a historian of them. That, that they, I met a woman down in Beirut, uh, France, one time, and she was an older aristocrat, and she, I was only in my twenties, and uh, she was telling me, you know, a bunch of stuff, and then, then she said, but the thing that infuriated her the most uh, about world history was that, that the French only missed having the world language by about thirty years. Oh, uh, you know that. It, that, that their language was on the way to being the world language, you know, in the middle, you know, after Napoleon and so on. Uh, and then things shifted and then the world went international and the, the British got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you have that kind of perspective. It's like there was a famous headline in uh, many years ago in the London Times that said, storm in the English Channel, continent cut off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, every group has it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... So uh, let's uh, let's go to the American colonies and 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 okay. the revolution. You know, you, you cover that very well, and it, it's a very interesting that all these uh, people are are faced with uh, the pursuit of freedom and and, mm -hmm. and are a little bit freer, uh, 
um, at the same time that there's slavery. And what a lot of people don't remember, uh, unless they've really studied it, is that there was slavery in all the colonies. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. It wasn't just the southern colonies. It was more in the south, but there was still slavery in all the colonies. So why don't you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that paradox? Sure. Well, let me start off by talking about how I've inter been, intervened in what's a, a big current debate about the American Revolution. And in many ways, it was sparked by the, the New York Times' 1619 project mm -hmm. um, a couple years ago. And the debate, the debate is everybody knows, you know, there's always been a lot of attention to the, the role of slavery in the American colonies in the American Revolution. But more recently, some people have argued that, well, one of the reasons for the American Revolution was a desire to preserve slavery. Okay, mm -hmm. so it was a revolution being fought for freedom, but also for slavery at the same time, or as some people put it, for the freedom to own slaves. And you, yeah. and you get this, <laughs> and you get the same discourse, the same idea in the Civil War on the side of the South. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Civil War, it's really the South in 1861 that is talking more about freedom than the North is, right? Mm -hmm. Because they want their right. freedom to own property, in this case, human property. Um, and so there's there's a couple of factors that enter into this paradox. Um, there were signals in Britain in the 1770s that the British were perhaps considering the abolition of slavery. There was the famous Somerset case mm -hmm. in the early 1770s where a slave brought from the American colonies to Britain pleaded successfully for his freedom, uh, which caused the judge to basically strike down the idea of slavery in the British in Britain, uh, mm -hmm. if not necessarily the British Empire. So it was certainly not definitive, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. there were many Southerners that looked at that and thought, you know, maybe our association with Britain might cause problems in terms of our ability to own slaves. And then there was, when the war starts, or at the very beginning of the war, um, uh, a British uh, official, uh, uh, Lord Dunmore, actually issues a call for slaves to revolt. To, to, or mm -hmm. at, least, at least for calls for slaves to be freed, and in effect that it is a call for a slave revolt. And that's why you have in the, the Declaration of Independence, one of the accusations against the British monarch is that, quote, he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us. Mm -hmm. What domestic insurrections refers to is slave revolts. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, a lot of slaves fled for their freedom during the, the, uh, during the Revolutionary War, including George Washington's own slaves. They mm -hmm. mostly deserted his plantation and headed towards British lines. A lot, number of slaves fought for the British and ended up ultimately in Canada as a result. And, um, and there were also slaves that fought for the United States. So it becomes a very complex question because um, for many slaves, the war represented an opportunity for liberation. And for many of them, they saw that liberation coming at the hands of the British against the people that owned them. Now, it's also important to emphasize that this was a huge debate among the colonists and that one of the results of the American Revolution is slavery largely ceases to exist in the North. Mm -hmm. Most northern, now northern states abolished slavery as a result of just trying to deal with this contradiction. But of course, it remains in the South. And thanks to the, the uh, invention and the, the expansion of the cotton economy in the early 19th century, becomes ever more powerful than it ever was. So you do have for whatever reasons the colonists revolted, revolted, the fact remains that basically the nation they founded was a republic based in slavery, a slave republic, which is in many ways a contradiction in terms, and yet that's what the United States was. Yeah, you, you also, uh, well, first it's a very interesting idea that Lord Dunmore, uh, his statement was the first emancipation proclamation and actually much right. newer. Um, so one question I had, is, and I know that historians don't like these what ifs, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, if there had been no American Revolution and, and, and no French Revolution, um, and so we're, we're talking about the, the paradox between liberty and racism, do you mm -hmm. think that there would be, uh, would have been less liberty, but also less uh, racism uh, hmm. if that had happened? Because, uh, you know, if we hadn't revolted from the British, the British would have uh, eliminated slavery 30 years earlier than the Civil mm -hmm. War did. Mm-hmm. So. No, that's true, of course, but you know, you could extend the what if because if America had remained, if the American colonies, which were very profitable slave economies, were the main part of the British Empire, that might have pushed the British not to abolish slavery <laughs> when they did. So there, there's that side of it too, which right? which points out, you know, I mean, Lord uh, Dunmore's uh, Emancipation Proclamation was just as politically expedient for his side as as uh, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln's was uh, in 1863. 
Um, maybe we can go to that now because the Civil War, okay. I mean, and you make that clear um, that this was was not really at least 100 uh, percent anti-slavery war. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I argue is that if the Civil War had ended quickly, slavery probably would have survived. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because there wasn't a lot of desire in the North to prosecute an anti-slave war. They wanted to keep the Union together. Lincoln wanted to keep the Union together. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, he was willing to compromise if it came down to it. Mm -hmm. But he, increasingly compromise was not possible for, I think, for a couple of reasons. There, again, there was the attitude of the British that um, the, the Civil War caused uh, most of the cotton from um, from the American South went to British cotton mills. It was mm -hmm. in many ways one of the major things that fueled the Industrial Revolution. And so during the 1860s, Britain experienced what was known as the cotton famine. Uh, mm -hmm. In places like Lancashire, uh, thousands and thousands of people were thrown out of work because there was no cotton coming in. That was an important inspiration for the British to try and preserve the, the slave economy. Yet on the other hand, anti-slavery was extremely popular in Britain. Uncle Tom's Cabin was one of the biggest selling books in Britain during the 19th century. Mm -hmm. It tied into the whole British Methodist liberal culture. And so the argument went that if the war became a war about slavery, there was no way you could have British intervention because the British people wouldn't stand for it. Uh, they mm -hmm. would not stand for going to, a, to fight for a war for slavery. But the other factor, as uh, W.B. Du Bois pointed out in his book on the Civil War, was that you, the South had a, an impossible task. It was fighting against uh, another region that was stronger than it, that had a larger population, while at the same time trying to suppress a third of its own population. Mm -hmm. um, and so all slaves had to do was simply refuse to work in many ways or run away, which they did, mm -hmm. and which would have drastically imp imp impaired the, the ability of the South to fight back. So those things really meant the end of the slave, you know, at the end of the possibility of the survival of slavery in uh, the South and in the United States it was as a result. Um, it's not to say the South didn't put up a great fight for it. It lasted four mm -hmm. years. But ultimately, it, there was no way it could su suppress a large part of its own population and win the war against a stronger power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the, the practicalities uh, are fascinating because, for example, the Emancipation Proclamation, as you point out, uh, was not applicable to the the furthest north states that had slaves, uh, but had not joined the, the Confederacy. And right, so like it Maryland, really wasn't. for example. It, it was like, we're, we're going to reward you for being on our side by letting you keep your slaves. Mm -hmm. And you point out, which we haven't talked about yet, that liberalism, which was part of this whole trend for the last 150 or so years, uh, that it had a big emphasis on property. And so since mm -hmm. slaves were considered property, that was a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. it, it contributed to the problem. No, absolutely. Slaves were probably the most important form of property in the United States during the early 19th century, just in terms of sheer value, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, liberalism often talks about the freedom to own one's own property, to do with what do with it as one sees fit without any uh, intervention by the state or public powers or anything like that. And in a society where the most important, most valuable form of property is slaves, uh, liberal ideas applied to that, right? And so it was. It was a difficult situation for many for many uh, white Americans to sort of square the circle on the fact. All right. Well, let's go back for just a second to, to the beginning of your book because uh, you, you talk about these two ideas: freedom, uh, liberty, and and uh, racism. Mm -hmm. um, and and you use Peter Pan and pirates uh, <laughs> a, a, as a good example of this um, and the way that people thought about it as a, as a story that captured it. I, I assume you you assume. That its popularity is due to the fact that it captures these these basic paradoxes and contradictions in the way that it's dealt with. So why don't you tell a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I could say that I, I talk about Peter Pan because in some ways I never really wanted to grow up. So, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I use this. the The first chapter is called Savage Freedom, and mm -hmm. what I'm interested in is the I ideas of freedom that depart from the norm and that ultimately have to be suppressed. Right, mm -hmm. in order to have uh, you know a, a, a kind of freedom that can emphasize property rights, that it can can emphasize liberal democracy, and so I choose two groups that represent that, and the two groups are pirates on the one hand, mm -hmm. and children on the other. Hence, mm -hmm. Peter Pan, right, which is a story yes. about children and pirates, and in fact, Peter Pan also represents the fact that after the suppression of piracy in the Caribbean, which happens in the early 18th century, 
Mm-hmm. The whole idea of piracy becomes increasingly infantilized. You know, pirates are relegated from the dangerous present to the sort of romanticized or fictionalized past or the fictional yeah. or, or land of fantasy, in effect. And partly that's what Peter Pan represents, pirates. And another group in Peter Pan that also takes this role is Native Americans, right? Mm-hmm, who right. are no longer present, who are kicked off the land, and now they can become figures of fantasy because they're no longer a threat in real life. Um, but what you get in Peter Pan, and what you get in this broader story is the idea of groups of people whose ideas of freedom have to be either suppressed or in the case of children, they have to be made to grow up. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to renounce their childhood dreams, their childhood ideas um, to become, as Peter Pan calls it, Englishmen with beards and jobs, right? <laughs> so, sort of standard representatives of the, establish, of the established order. And it's interesting to note in a, Peter, in a novel like Peter Pan, there is a certain amount of ambiguity as to the desirability of this freedom. Uh, mm-hmm. First of all, Peter Pan never joins. He stays a, a, a figure of fantasy. Uh, and some of the other characters at times look back longingly at this. And or so, we'll or, to, or forget. Or have to forget it all, yeah. Or have to forget. It was like, you know, yeah. the whole idea of children grow up by forgetting what it's like to yeah. be a child, by forgetting the things that they knew it for certain when they were three years old, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And that process has to happen. But um, so, yeah, I, I thought about piracy. And I, the other thing about piracy, of course, is that it's, it's also a crime against property, ultimately. Mm-hmm. That, right. that is its damning sin in the ideas of the establishment, why it has to be suppressed. But the very act of suppressing piracy turns it into this legendary uh, image of, of freedom, of a certain kind of non-white freedom, if you will, or black freedom mm-hmm. that departs from the norms of white freedom. Um, and there are many examples of this. Uh, another example, fascinatingly enough, is, which we've seen also recently, is the Confederate flag. Mm-hmm. which once the th- South is defeated in the Civil War, emerges as a symbol of the rebel, which is what it is today, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and the fact that it's grew, uh, it, is, it arose out of a white supremacist rising um, is sometimes acknowledged, sometimes not. But the, it's mostly seen as a, the symbol of somebody who doesn't want to conform to mm-hmm. the normal normative order, right? Um, yeah, interesting. And, the, the, uh, an- another uh, couple of the strands, just to go back into history just a little bit here, um, between liberty and racism, is uh, that you talk about slavery being no longer white once the Barbary pirates, they were the last group that, that enslaved whites. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that happened around the same time. And you also discuss right. the fact that in the colonies, um, there are, are different forms of indentured servitude and so mm-hmm. on, which were not based on race, but eventually mm-hmm. became racial. So that there's a confluence of a diminishment of white slavery in the world and a, and a more focus in America on African-American slavery. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think most people who've studied anything about slavery realize that, I mean, it used to be that the Scandinavians would, would steal, uh, you know, other Scandinavian women right. and sell them to the Ottomans and so on. So this has been going on for, for a long, long mm-hmm. time. Um, but, but historically, it, it turns out as a, as with American timing, to have coalesced into a, a, a racial issue. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a lot of ways. So that the idea of the, the white slave trade increasingly becomes uh, framed around the abdic- abduction and mistreatment of women, right? Yeah. Um, white slavery, right? So, um, but yeah, you had the decline of, of and in fact, the decline of the idea of piracy as uh, representing a broad swath of people rather being figures of... Um, fantasy in some ways. But the other point I was going to make, and I talk about this in the book, and that's uh, internet pirates. So with, with the 21st century, we have this revival of the whole idea of piracy. There's a, a wonderful image, which I include in the book, that shows a pirate ship with a cassette on it on one of the main sails. Yeah, yeah. And the caption is, you call it piracy, we call it freedom. So, right. right, right. So the, the whole generation of Napster, for example, and file sharing. It was it was I, I, ironic to me to, to read about that and say, geez, that's already really history. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. Because uh, that was such a big thing and, and such a big push, and and you know, everybody worked around it, and 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 it's it, everybody, society, you know, grabbed all around it and took their pieces, made a deal, and 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 left it mm-hmm. behind. Yeah. <laughs> but as a result, you had the generation of literally pirate parties. <laughs> 
in, yeah. in Europe, for example, in Sweden and in West Germany, places like that. So, yeah. Well, that's what New Jersey was uh, was supposed to be a pirate, you know, piracy thing when the Dutch ran Manhattan. Right, and, right. You know, right. I mean, we, we, we have to mention San Francisco's Barbary Coast. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, already, yeah. Already infantilizing it. Well, not not so infantilizing it because it was not not known for it was known for its adult entertainment, but still, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, uh, fascinating. So let, let's uh, let's uh, talk. I mean, you, you have a you know, great analysis also of World War One, World War Two, how that played in all. Before we get there, though. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I'd like you to talk a little bit more about it. The, the fact that as slavery was forbidden and, and made illegal, that the next phase uh, was colonialism or that that, that had mm -hmm. already existed. But, mm -hmm. but the, the one really got a big increase uh, as the other one went down. And it sort of reminds me of how, you know, slavery was put to an end in 1865. And then there was, you know, a, a incarceration in order to, to mm -hmm. make the people work anyway. Uh, and then there was the Jim Crow laws when that didn't work. But now we're back to mass incarceration again. And so it's yeah. like the, the problem just keeps being adjusted in a different way. And what you said about colonialism, which is, you know, a whole worldwide phenomenon um, as a reaction to the end of slavery, I thought was very interesting. No, it's, it's really fascinating because in many cases, colonialism arose out of the attempts to suppress slavery. Mm -hmm. So, whereas European nations like France and Britain in the 18th century had had little, like, little trading posts on the coast of Africa, one of their justifications for going upriver into the interior of African societies was to suppress the slave trade at its source. Mm -hmm. So, the invasion of Africa is partly justified and partly, and this was not necessarily cynical, partly it was done with mm -hmm. an idea to stamping out the slave trade. By the early 19th century, for example, the British Navy, the largest navy in the world, was actively apprehending slave trading vessels, right, and trying to stamp out the slave trade on the high seas. And then that leads to trying to stamp out the slave trade at its source. But it, it's something I find is also, it's another paradox in effect because, and it's especially true in the case of France, the, the French Third Republic, which is created in the 1870 as a result of the overthrow of the Second Empire, the last French Empire, uh, establishes France for the rest of its uh, history to the present day as a republic, as a republic based on universal manhood suffrage, emphasizing mm -hmm. democracy. It's the same state that is born out of the revolt against empire that goes on to establish the largest empire in French history. Um, far larger than that of the second empire, it is the, the state that creates the empire in Indochina, for example, um, in much of Africa, in parts of Asia. So it is, it is a real paradox because you have an emperor being an empire being run by a republic, or as I like to put it, an empire without an emperor, mm -hmm. uh, a democratic state in Europe, and an imperial colonial state overseas. And my uh, reaction to that was ultimately the difference is racial, that you have an empire of bra black and brown subjects ruled mm -hmm. by, over by a republic of white citizens. Yeah. Yeah, the, the paradox and, and, and uh, the timing and everything, you make it very clear in your book, you know, how this came about. Um, and I, I find that fascinating because people take it for granted uh, that it's been this way the whole time when, when we really can unmix these ideas again. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, like any other reform uh, that you've mentioned, it always keeps coming out in another way or, you know, it, it takes time to unravel these things. Mm -hmm. So we get we get past the colonial period. I mean, not, not that it was done yet, um, mm -hmm. but that the world wars were something like you know the last gasp of both empire and colonialism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I mean World War One is special. I mean, I, and I've written a lot about World War One. It's a real seminal conflict. My grandfather was also a soldier in World War One, so uh -huh. he talked about it when I was little. But um, it's a war that sees itself as creating freedom for for peoples throughout the world that you know the the war ends up with the first truly worldwide peace conference in mm -hmm. human history the peace of paris and that ends up signing the treaty of versailles in 1919 and one of the dominant figures is the american president woodrow wilson who was the one who's arguing for freedom and for independence of nations, he's the one that organizes the, the um, recasting of the former empires of, the, of Russia and Austria-Hungary and Germany into independent states like Poland and Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. Mm 
And he very much has embraced this idea. Woodrow Wilson was also somebody, a Southerner uh, from a sla- uh, some an originally slave-owning family, and somebody who had his own racial practices. In the United States, he largely en- uh, engineered the sort of segregation of the Washington, of the federal bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Um, but he also creates, helps to create a world where, again, there's a real racial dividing line between those who are free and those who are not. On the one hand, you have the European empires being broken up and turned into independent states. Uh, the Asian and African empires, on the other hand, are not only let stand, but in many ways reinforced. So mm-hmm. the British and the French come out of the war with more colonies in Asia and Africa than they had before the war. And it really reinforces this idea that um, basically freedom is for white people um, mm-hmm. and liberal democracy and independence. Those are for white states and white nations and not for peoples of color. Yeah, and you cast uh, World War II as being the definitive, um, you know, uh, war that then made it clear that freedom might be for everybody. Mm-hmm. That's right, because you have a tremendous mobilization mm-hmm. of many different py- types of people of color throughout the world. Uh, you know, one example, for example, is Indochina or Vietnam, mm-hmm. where the the movement led by Ho Chi Minh, the famous Ho Chi Minh is a movement for national independence against both the Japanese who are occupying into China during the Second World War, but also against the French. I mean, Ho Chi Minh and his allies had no illusions that they mm-hmm. had to fight on both fronts. And of course, as soon as the Japanese are defeated, they go onto a war footing with the French mm-hmm. to try to achieve uh, their own independence. Um, another example is the, the campaign in the United States. It was called the Double V Campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, by launched by African Americans, that in many ways it was a pre- sort of predecessor to the civil rights movement, because people argued that yes, we should fight for victory overseas, but we should also fight for victory at home mm-hmm. at the same time. And the two struggles are indistinguishable, and we have to engage in both. And there were even like double V hairstyles that became popular in the 1940s mm-hmm. because it was a, truly a popular movement. And so I, you know, I, I focus on that era because you really have this worldwide sort of challenge to the old idea of white freedom and the idea both in the empires and in the united states that freedom was to be ev- for everybody because everybody was fighting to be free and with the growth of democracy another you know idea which was uh, coming along at the same time over the last 150 200 years that you're talking about um people began to identify the vote as the indicator the the, the that you're free Mm-hmm. Uh, which, of course, um, you know, started uh, with just landowners and a few white men um, or mm-hmm. a relatively small percentage of the population. Um, and then it gets kept growing um, and, mm-hmm. and expanding. And each, each expansion then led to another group that said, me too, me too, you know, and all, all of which uh, led, which, which you talk about the Statue of Liberty for, for a long time mm-hmm. in your book, which is very interesting because you you mentioned it's also ironic and a paradox that it's a woman uh, statue mm-hmm. and they, they didn't have any right to vote themselves. Right. So why don't That's you right. talk about the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the coexistence of these other paradoxes? Um, it, it's interesting because it's like anything that progresses uh, or, or changes over time. People just don't see the whole picture. They, they see a little bit of it, a little bit of it here, a little bit. Now I, now I need something. So um, I, I, yeah, well, let me let me say a couple of things first. I mean, uh, talk about the whole issue of uh, gender and voting rights because that's the great dividing line in uh, the modern world. Um, the fact that, for example, to take a country like Britain, over the course of the 19th century, gradually more and more groups of men were allowed to vote. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't really until 1919 when women are granted the vote that you have this idea that ultimately all adults should have this right. This should just be part of being a mature citizen. And even then, actually... When women are granted the right to vote, this becomes an issue for the um, for the suffragette movement, um, for the Pankhurst family in particular. It's only women of property that are granted the right to vote. It's not until mm-hmm. the end of the 1920s that all women are granted this right. Uh, in France, it's not until 1946, the aftermath of the Second World War, that women finally win the vote, uh, literally a century after men had universal manhood suffrage had been passed. So that's, that's one example at the most extreme of how the right to vote – 
really speaks to the right to be free, right? Um, right? For many women, they could also not own property in their own names if they were married, for example. In the 19th century, they, had, uh, they lacked other freedoms as well. Um, but yeah, to move on to the Statue of Liberty, um, one of the points I try to make about the Statue of Liberty is, as I call it, the white woman on a pedestal, mm-hmm. which is that she symbolizes liberty, yet she's also unmoving, She's sort of hemmed in. She is, in in some ways, both symbolizing power and powerlessness at the Mm -hmm. same time. And one of the ways you can see this is by comparing the image of the Statue of Liberty with a famous French painting, uh, Liberty Liberty Leading the People by Eugène de la Croix, Mm -hmm. which shows also a, a a woman as a figure of liberty. But in de la Croix's painting, the woman is uh, armed. She's leading an army. She's very much in motion. She's very dynamic and very powerful. So she's not, she's also bare breasted. She's not this chaste figure Mm -hmm. that you find on the top of the Statue of Liberty. So, yeah, and you also talk about how the torch that she carries is different than a a, a bottle of gasoline that's used to to, uh, ignite uh, the revolution. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, the you know people said people said it was a torch and not a flame, right? Right. Um, yeah. But you also had this during the the the, the Parisian uprising in 1871, known as the Paris Commune. Commune, you had this image of women that were supposedly running around the city, uh, setting it on fire. Female fire. Uh, bombers, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't exist as far as anybody can tell, but nonetheless, it was a powerful <laughs> stereotype. And if you look at pictures of, they were called the petroleurs, right? Yeah. The female fire bombers. If you look at pictures of them, they bear an uncanny resemblance both to Eugène Delacroix's painting, but also the Statue of Liberty, this woman holding a flame. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, the idea is that the Statue of Liberty, the flame has to be domesticated. It's to illuminate not to destroy, right? And on the other hand, she's holding a book, which presumably she can read the book by the light of the flame, right? Right, right. So, yeah. Well, there's uh, one of the the best arguments that you have for the idea that freedom was defined only as white was that uh, earlier in the century, uh, around the 1800s, that when the expansion of the vote went out to more and more white men, it was taken away from women of with property and and so people lost the right to vote as it expanded out in the direction of white males. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And the other thing about that was that during the early 19th century, as the vote is, vote is being gradually expanded for white men, it's being restricted for for black men. So mm-hmm. that, for example, by the 1830s, only the New England England only the New England states allowed freed African American men to vote. Not a single state that was admitted to the union after like 1810 granted the right to vote to African-American men. So you have sort even of two different... Even the free ones. Yeah. yeah even, oh, yeah, even the free yeah, ones, right. Even the free ones, yeah. So you have this... Was there, any, was there any backup? Was there any state that had, had you know, say, uh, free uh, black men that had property could vote, and then they took it away? I know that that was done to women. Do you know of any experiences of the other one? I'm not sure, but I think there were, there were a few states in, um, in the North that gradually restricted... The, the suffrage yeah. for African American men, or, yeah. or abolished it basically. So, um, so you have these parallel, this parallel evolution towards more freedom for white men, mm-hmm. uh, freedom to vote, uh, and less freedom for uh, men of color and others. In the in the West, for example, it was you know Latinos, for example, were uh, at times they were seen as white, at times they were seen as not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but their ability to vote was definitely challenged, as was that of Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's one ph- phenomenon I like to call the white to vote, because in effect that's what it became yeah. by the middle of the 18th century, by the 19th century, by the middle of the 19th century, by the 1850s, basically all white men in America could vote. Right? Mm-hmm. There was no property qualifications anymore, but the franchise was still very very restricted for other groups and non-existent for women. Yeah, and there was a scene in in Huckleberry Finn uh, by Mark Twain where. Uh, the uh, the drunk and uh, uh, dissolute father of Huckleberry Finn uh, complains that you know a preacher, a well-spoken preacher who's uh, a mulatto, uh, gets to vote in Illinois, but you know he's not going to vote anymore if that that's allowed. You know that that kind right, of right. Yeah, and and obviously the irony of the situation was was the intent of the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and, but that was, I mean, that was true in a lot of ways, right? People had this idea that the right to vote was associated uh, among men with white skin, right? And yeah. white privilege, basically. 
So uh, let's let's come up uh, closer to uh, our current time. Um, you you uh, focus on uh, near the end about Martin Luther King and his his drive and mm-hmm. the Civil Rights Act of '65 uh, that granted the right to vote as as a, a, a huge watershed of, of really post World War II till 1965 that 20 year period pushing to to mm-hmm. make freedom not just a white phenomenon but universalize it. Um, mm-hmm. And then, of course, the backlash, uh, you know, came after it. But, but why, don't, why don't you talk about how that came about? Because it was an interesting period of time and several, again, a, a confluence of several factors that allowed that to happen. Yeah, and what I, I, what I enjoy doing in the book is talking about two parallel developments, the mm-hmm. civil rights movement in the United States and the movement for decolonization in the European empires. So the other reason 1965 is so important is that by 1965, virtually all the European colonies had gained their independence mm-hmm. in one way or another. The only European co- country that had a, a, any sort of formal colonies left was Portugal, which was the weakest, poorest country in Europe. Mm-hmm. And so that having empire at that point became a symbol of weakness rather than of strength, right? Mm-hmm. So you have both in the United States and in Africa and Asia, these tremendous movements for, for liberty after the Second World War that, that ultimately culminate in 1965. And I really do emphasize the importance of that date because, you know, even though there are many challenges that remain and many other challenges that resurface, the idea that freedom should be universal, you know, is never going to disappear after that date. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it remains very much an idea of many people, if not most people, throughout the world. Um, and so it's an important to emphasize that in spite of the fact that there is also this counter reaction in mm-hmm. both parts of the world that reasserts the idea of white freedom. Nonetheless, it is never going to be challenged. It, it, white freedom is never going to be unchallenged again. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think that for people who are, are very uh, pessimistic about the future, I think it's important for ideas, to see the ideas and their progress uh, not going in a linear fashion, of course, Mm -hmm. but that there are big points that change everything. I'm sure that there are some people who still wonder, you know, why don't we have the flat earth? Uh, You know, I mean, I really like the (laughs) flat earth, you know, and there is a flat earth society, but, you know, the market share that they have of of the audience is very, very tiny at this point. Um, Mm -hmm. But a a similar one uh, is, is educating women. You know, people thought you can't educate women. Well, mm-hmm. it's impossible after the 20th century to say you can't educate women. You can be against it if you want to, mm-hmm. but you can never say that it's, it doesn't work. You know? Right. All you have to do is look who are the students in our colleges and universities exactly. now, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's done. And just like you said, so the, the point has been made. Now we have to make it effective and more effective and more effective um, mm-hmm. and, and push it out. Um, but I think that people who you know, should realize that's the process of civilization. If you're working on that process of civilization, it's going to move that forward. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that that will keep being moved forward. So um, oh, to go back to something else that you, you told a story, which I really liked. Um, in 1957, Martin Luther King Jr. met uh, Richard Nixon. And, but but mm-hmm. say where, you tell the story of where you met him. <laughs> that was it, was in, it was in newly independent Ghana, right? Mm-hmm. And they were both there to celebrate uh, Ghanaian independence. And of course, you know, Richard Nixon is there as the vice president of the United States. And so he's talking with Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King says, well, basically, you should come back and see what, how we do the same thing back in Georgia, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and yeah, because of course, the civil rights movement had already started. Martin Luther King was already very much involved. But, you know, it shows how there was this, this interrelationship between these different movements. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was, it was a great story. I wonder, you know, whether Nixon paid any attention. Um, but, but he, he, you know, for all the other things that he did, he, he, he didn't uh, oppose that so much, right? Mm-hmm. Was, uh, there, there, were, there were several progressive stuff that was done while he was president as well. Later no, on, absolutely. So. Abs- yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. and, you know, the, the, the civil rights movement was in many ways a gigantic popular movement and not just among blacks. Uh, yeah. It really did represent a fundamental change in American society. And even though there have been movements against its legacy, very powerful ones, it still retains that. So, I mean, that is, you, you asked earlier about me ending the book on a positive note. Yeah. And this is sort of why, I mean, and in, its, in, in an interesting way, even the events of January 6th reinforced that for mm-hmm. me, because this whole presumption of white privilege and white freedom 
was seen by most people in the country as beyond the pa- beyond quote beyond the pale, right? <laughs> uh, as sort of you know, Good not choice of words, <laughs> insupportable, right? As wrong, basically, and yeah. as the as the 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 work of a, an extreme element in American mm-hmm. society that did not represent America as a whole, and and fortunately was relatively disorganized and and uh, you know not. That's one of the, as I say, that's one of the good things about anarchy is it's very hard to get it organized. <laughs> yes. It's like the light bulb joke about anarchists. How many anarchists does it take to screw in a light bulb? All of them, right? <laughs> 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 well, uh, the, the fundamental idea that you have, when, when we go back, if we want to talk about, you know, some of these issues um, in, in detail in terms of how it affects the 21st century, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have uh, a country, China, again, uh, that used to be the, one of the dominant economies in the, in the uh, world uh, only 500 mm-hmm. years ago. And then they, as you said, uh, they, they turned back and said, there's nothing out there for us. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Europeans and, and the Japanese came and colonized mm-hmm. them. And so now they're, they're on their way back. Um, but they're, they're combining our ideas in a way that's paradoxical. It's a, to me, it's almost like we have a, this cultural exchange going on uh, mm-hmm. that they're, they're borrowing capitalism, even though they're communist, and using some of those ideas of mm-hmm. economic freedom in order to create a, a, a brighter economy. Um, and we're borrowing their shame culture um, hmm. to try to mm-hmm. keep, keep people you know, uh, a, a little bit in line uh, the way they did in the 1960s. Yeah. But the, yeah. Talk about uh, the, the China and, and how you see it uh, as a historian. Um, no, that's not your, your, your specialty mm-hmm. or anything, but I'm sure you've thought about it because I know you. Uh, mm-hmm. And how they're moving, how they're progressing, and they're, again, paradoxically using this idea. And there's all kinds of people who say, well, now that they've used economic freedom, they have to have political freedom. But it, it right. doesn't always work like that. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't. I mean, China was the, the sort of emergence of, you know, sort of prosperous China was the great story of the 1990s in many ways. Yeah. Uh, with the liberalization of land tenure, and the ability to create businesses, they, you know, they really unleashed the, the energy of the Chinese people and, cr- and created this incredible economy that is still booming to this day. And yet at the same time, it remains an authoritarian state in a lot of ways. It does not have a certain kind of liberal freedom. And so that raises the question of the many different kinds of freedom. Uh, you know, one of the classic examples in China is the one-child policy, mm-hmm. which says that you, know, you as a couple, as a couple can only have one child, right? Mm-hmm. Which was very effective economically. And yet talk about a limitation on one's freedom, right? Mm-hmm. This is, it's hard to get more invasive than that. So you have an invasive state that has created a certain kind of freedom based on prosperity for people at the sacrifice of other kinds of freedoms as well. And I guess the, the $64 question is, to what extent do the Chinese people accept this, uh, buy into this, or will they one, one day reject it? Mm-hmm. You mentioned in your book the Tiananmen Square uh, goddess of democracy um, Mm -hmm. when you were talking about the the Statue of Liberty. So um, that was my launching point for this thing. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because uh, those of us who who were paying attention remember that statue and so forth. But uh, I want to say one thing that I thought was very interesting about that period of time was, uh, you know, people complain about the media a lot for, for various reasons of what's happened in the last 20 years. But I thought it was unbelievable that the media people would interview these young uh, people on the square, um, put mm-hmm. them on international television, having to know that those those kids were, were going to jail or going to be killed within a week right. or two. I, I found that unbelievably irresponsible. Well, but it, put it this way, it's sort of like all those January 6th rioters who were not wearing masks because of their freedom not to wear masks, which, of course, made it, it very easy to identify and arrest some of them, right? right. So, so you get that kind of thing as well. Yeah, Tiananmen Square is interesting because it represents one of the, the most important representations of the Statue of Liberty outside the United States and one in the, the middle of a full-fledged revolution. Um, and yet there was a, a whiteness aspect to it, too, because as I argue in my book, Tiananmen Square followed hard on a series of riots against African students in China uh, Mm -hmm. who were seen as unduly privileged in a way that other foreign students were not. Um, And many of the same people that participated in these uh, attacks on African students were very much supportive of the movement for Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. So there was an issue of of white freedom there as well. Plus, of course, the Statue of Liberty itself did not look Chinese at all in Tiananmen Square. It looked very white. Right. Right. 
Yeah, interesting choice. Um, even in uh, you know, even in religion, um, people will take their you know Jesus or or whoever mm -hmm. uh, Buddha, and they will make them look a lot like their culture. You know, they will they will shift it over to looking the way that they want them to. Uh, which which uh, reminds me of one of the things I thought when I was reading your book that Tyler wants us to 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 uh, uh, you know stop being so hypocritical about these ideas and these paradoxes. Um, and I don't think he's going to have any better luck than Jesus did with the Pharisees. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Please do not compare me to Jesus. Um, you know, well, you know, it's like the, the tradition of the Hollywood's blonde Jesus, right? That yeah, we all yeah. grew up watching in those Hollywood movies, right? Yeah, that kind exactly. of that kind of issue. So, well, I don't know what kind of success I'll have, but yeah, it's important to throw these ideas out, and it's um, great to have people think about them and talk about them. Yeah. Well, one of the things uh, we'll talk one one last thing, so we'll wrap mm -hmm. it up with this. Um, but uh, one of the things uh, you know, is, uh, Humanities West does, or study the different periods of time and in, in, in history and so on. Uh, one of the patterns that I've seen is that uh, the times when a culture is extremely confident is the time when it's very tolerant of of other viewpoints mm -hmm. because they're mm -hmm. so confident that their way of doing things is right. Um, if you if you go back to 150 years after the Muslims took over the Mediterranean, then mm -hmm. they were bringing in stuff from all over the world and studying stuff from all over the world. Right. Um, Britain did the same thing at a certain point when they felt they were in charge. France did the same thing. Spain did the same thing at different points. And the United States after World War II mm -hmm. unleashed its tolerance. Um, and so uh, if you're talking about reform movements and if you want to reform things and bring these paradoxes to an end and, and to, to move it forward to the main principle so that it's universally applicable. Um, it seems like it's a, not a good idea to attack the cultural confidence of the group that, uh, of, of, of a group that you're living under, um, mm -hmm. because that seems to be, you, you would almost want to bolster it so that they feel confident enough to be tolerant of, of the next change, the next move up. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, looking at our contemporary debates about immigration, Mm -hmm. um, those who are opposed to immigration tend to ignore the fact that most immigrants who come here want to be American, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they're coming here. They want to embrace, you know, they, they don't want to get rid of every bit of their culture, but they want to interweave those cultures into American life and American culture. And that's the way yeah. America has developed. So it's not an, at all an assault on American culture. Uh, which, of course, has its right. own multicultural origins. It's rather, and, 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 you know, you see this all the time. It's in many ways trying to reinforce the idea of America because that's why people want to come here. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great example because um, the people who want it uh, saved for whites, freedom saved for whites, uh, mm -hmm. would ensure that the whites, and nobody would have freedom, you know, within a couple centuries. Right, right. It, it, it's taking that idea and having everyone share it, it, it Sharing the culture, sharing the cultural ideals doesn't mean sharing everything, just the main things that make everything go along, as you said. Um, and the rest of it, one of the things that people have said, my European friends, you probably have had the same thing, you know, uh, America is so homogenous and, you know, we don't really want mm -hmm. that to happen with the European Union. We don't, you know, the French don't want to have too much mm -hmm. uh, Wiener Schnitzel, you know, and, and <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and I always say, what are you worried about? All you have to do is go to the United States, go to New Orleans and go to Chicago, you know, mm -hmm. and you'll see that for 200 years, they've been part of the same thing. And, and for another thousand years, it'll still be obvious that New Orleans had a different background than Chicago did. Right. That's yeah. right. It, it really, really is not a fear that people really need to indulge in. And therefore, maybe it'll be easier to, to, to expand out and, and accept the universality of some of these principles. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, we, we, we promote democracy everywhere in the world and our politicians gerrymander all their seats in order to make sure that they get their next elections. We don't yeah. really believe in it ourselves, you know, so we, <laughs> we believe in it when it's, it's good. It's good to get on the page of your own ideals uh, before yeah. you spread them other places. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what, what uh, you know, you, know you, you, you end with your hope. You want to express your mm -hmm. hope in another way. I love the way you said the goalposts have been moved. And that was a great image. Yeah. yeah. Just in general, I think that, I mean, let me give one example. The whole um, Black Lives Matter movement that, was, that got a real push from the, um, the murder of George Floyd last summer. Mm -hmm. um, I think for many African Americans like myself, the biggest thing we took away from that was how many white people were getting involved in Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. 
and how how impressive and how how unexpected that was. Mm-hmm. So I think America and France, the other country I look at, you know, are you know are going to be able to experience those kinds of changes because there is a lot of determination to make this world better. And there's a lot of attention to questions of racism that are a real problem in ways that, you know, I haven't experienced in my life before until now. So yeah. uh, I think that's a very hopeful sign. There's going to be lots of bumps on the way, but I think we're ultimately headed to a better place. That's great. And it's a great place to end. So thank you very much, Tyler. Um, as I said, welcome back to San Francisco uh, virtually. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate work. It's a great book on, on the history of the last couple hundred years on this big issue um, and uh, congratulations on the timing of it. That's really uh, excellent that you had perceived it in advance because it's such a big issue right now. Well, so. thank you, George. And thank you for everybody who's taking part in this. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you for letting me talk about my ideas. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. So ends another event at the Commonwealth Club and it's 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us.